Hi. I'm so glad you're here. I woke up in the middle of the night with a panic that if no one showed up for this, could I still count it on digital measures? <laughs> <laughs> but we don't have to worry about that. So I'm Mary Ellen Greenwood. Um, I'm starting my fourth year as a lecturer in the English department. Bonnie Moore is also one of our fantastic lecturers. And then Susan. Susan is a senior lecturer, and she helps to run the Writing Center. So we're here to talk about pedagogical risks. Um, our overview for today, we're going to try to get through as quickly as possible because we do want to have a group conversation at the end, some ideas that you've tried. We want this to be idea sharing. We want to see what people have tried. Um, I'm briefly going to talk about why risk taking is so important for us to model for our students. Bonnie, Susan, and I will each share different experiences, very different experiences, but coming to these same results, these goals that we want to have for our students. Um, our very own Matthew Sanders, in his book, Becoming a Learner, differentiates between student and learner. A student waits for direction, learns for the test, is externally motivated, avoids challenging situations, sees learning as obligation, and learns to do. Our goal is to help our students see this role as a learner, the one that they want to embrace, where they seek out opportunities, they learn for understanding, they are internally motivated, they seek out the challenging situations, they see learning as an opportunity, and they learn to learn. So with that in mind, he continues on and says, Learners aren't afraid of hard work. They're not afraid of challenging situations. But learning requires stretching and growing and courage. So if we encourage this in our students, what happens if maybe then we model risk taking and a sense of vulnerability as teachers in our own classroom? Um, Kristen Wong, in an article that just came out in the last couple of weeks in the New York Times, talks about broad learning. and that we want to learn skills in a forgiving environment, encouraging our students that it's OK to make mistakes. It's OK to fail. It's OK to learn from those mistakes. It's learning for the sake of learning. So we ask students to push themselves. So do we then give examples of how it's done? So when we talk about vulnerability, we're talking about these feelings of being susceptible to failure or to criticism. But vulnerability is a necessary feeling in order to push yourself to something greater. We have to consider these uh, bullet points, though. Vulnerability is relative. So what might feel comfortable to you is going to seem risky to maybe someone else. So for a music professor, breaking out into song in the middle of a class, that's, that's totally natural. That's something that they do. Um, an engineering professor breaking out into song in the middle of a class, that's going to take a little vulnerability especially if they don't sing on key, like I don't. So we have to consider, too, something that might be appropriate in one pedagogical situation might not in another. So you have to consider your course objectives. What will work? What can you try that's new, that's different, that pushes you in a different direction? So we're going to start with Bonnie. OK, so uh, I teach a class called the Lytton Culture of the Farm. Um, and we use a lot of different kinds of sources in this class. We use written sources. We use quilts made by the G's Van Quilders of Alabama when we're talking about uh, slavery and how that impacted agriculture in the history of the United States. We use parodies of songs. We use all different kinds of um, sources in this class. And so uh, one of the ways that I try to um, engage my students and take a risk in front of them there with the hopes of becoming a place where they feel safe to take a risk is by singing in class. This is a literature class. It's, it's really not a music class, but we sing in class. So um, yeah, we can go ahead to the next one. Um, oh, yeah, my students uh, self-design a work, a, a, work um, a field trip. They go, they go on a field trip that they design themselves, each student. And I try to encourage them to incorporate what we're doing in class with their other um, learning goals, what they are interested in. So uh, they have to take a risk here. And I've had students who have ridden a tractor for the very first time, who have gone on a horseback trip to do a roundup. For the, they've never been on a horse before. 
um, who have been actually even um, helping castrate lambs. <laughs> I've had students who have taken big risks. And um, I try to set the example for them by taking a risk in front of them myself. Um, a place that is outside of my comfort zone for sure, I'm going to model this for you. Um, and so then they're feeling like they can also take a risk outside their comfort zone and do something new, something different that will help them in their learning and help them experience more what farming in this case is about and what the literature and the culture of farming entails. So um, I'm going to tell you right now that I am not a great singer. I don't have a, a, a great voice. It's definitely not a solo voice. Um, and it will shake because I'm nervous. <laughs> but um, I'm just going to set this down. Um, but this is what I do in my class. So um, this song is uh, one that was, has been in my family for at least seven generations. We talk about folklore in this class, about farm folklore specifically. Um, this song is fits into that category. It's in the route index of folk songs. And um, we sing it, and then we talk about, oh, I better take this out. You can tell I'm a little nervous. Uh, we talk about the functions of this folklore and how it functions, and why would a family keep this song in their family for that long of a time, for seven, at least seven generations. So um, I'm going to start singing, and I want you guys to, as you, this is a ballad, so it repeats a lot. You'll be able to pick up the melody. And I would like you to sing along with me as we go along. OK. Yeah. The sun had gone down behind yon hill across the dreary moor. When hungry and cold, the poor boy came up to a farmer's door. Sorry. Sing, can you tell me if any there be who'd give to me a
not a soloist. Um, but this does something in my class. After, I've never quantified it. I haven't taken a test or a, a, done a survey. But the feeling in my class after we have this experience changes. Because my students realize I'm willing to, put a ri to take a risk. I'm willing to do something that's really hard for me to do in front of all of them. They can see, you could hear, <laughs> that I wasn't. Um, a professional singer, but um, I was willing to do it. And so then they're willing to take that risk with me. They know that I'm approachable. They know that I'm a human being. They know that they can come and talk to me about whatever problems they're having with, with my class. Um, and they're willing to take a risk as far as their um, uh, field trip goes. And it changes the feeling between my students and me every single time. So. I just encourage you to think about a risk you could take in your class to make your students be able to feel like you're a learner along with them, that you're willing to engage in this process of um, trying to be human. Thanks. maybe the work that we do. Since I teach a lot of writing, work the writing center, uh, revision is a big part of our work. And we get to revise the way that we teach and think every single semester if we want to. Isn't that a great thing about teaching? Another thing that I love about teaching is that uh, we can be surprised by our students and that we can learn from our students. And one way to do this is to ask Questions. This is kind of my my risk taking here. When I ask questions, is this like that we have a question that we'll, we'll work on for the entire class period, and it's a question that especially when you don't know the answer, like I don't have any preconceived notions of what <coughs> I'm expecting them to say. I don't know what they're going to say. I went through a period in my teaching where I did a lot of the preconceived things, and I'd say. That's the question, and I say, I'm like, I'm asking you to read my mind, aren't I? Oh, oh, not such a good thing. I wanted to throw that out and ask authentic questions. Authentic questions are those um, with many right answers, many possibilities, and maybe no answers at all. Um, maybe it's just something that leads to more questions. And I'm sorry, I forgot to turn on my mic. <laughs> um, this uh, uh, question here, is it possible to in teach English so that people stop killing each other? Now, I teach English, I teach English lit, culture, and writing. And um, I have this question on the board as students come in. They have previously, before they come to class, they have watched um, the, the film, the play, Moises Kaufman play, um, the Laramie Project, and it's about the 1990, it's kind of the aftermath of the 1998 killing of a 20-year-old Matthew Shepard because he's gay. Many of you might remember that. Um, they come in, and I have this question on the board, and rather than 
analyzing the play um, or, or um, talking about it in other ways, I say, sit down for six minutes, write about, write, write about this question. Take six minutes, they write about this. And then we have a really great discussion. And like I said, there are many ways that we co I could approach this. And I have approached it in the past. But this is, feels like it's a, it's a big risk because I don't know what they're going to say. I don't know what they're going to come up with. But I can tell you, as Bonnie said earlier, every single time that I've done this, and I've done it several times now, it is, it's the class to remember throughout the semester for me and for them. Um, this question, it comes from uh, Mary O'Reilly's uh, book, The Peaceable Classroom. And she asked this question as uh, a graduate student uh, during the Vietnam War. And it's just so equal, equally uh, you know, relevant today. Can we? It makes me vulnerable as a teacher because I also say, it's always it comes up, uh, can I? So this is a class often, it's, it's mostly pre-service teachers. And so we say, can we? Can we do that? Is it possible to teach in our di disciplines so that people start hate, stop hating, killing, and hurting each other? And sometimes we do get emotional. I get emotional when I teach and, and think about this question. Um, so I can talk about my own worries as a teacher, about the, my um, worries that my making an impact. And we can discuss that. OK, next question, another one. Um, I can have this on the board as, as students come in. My culture class, we spend a lot of time talking about the 1960s. And uh, we talk about the, that turbulent decade. And um, you know, we've, we, we talk about uh, the civil rights movement, um, assassinations, the Vietnam War a little bit, and how that affected us culturally. Um, and then I put this on the board and say this is you know, one of the 100 most influential photographs of all time, according to Time Magazine. Why? Ask them to free write about it for a little while. And this allows us to take what they have learned in past classes throughout this, this whole unit that I've been teaching and kind of uh, summarize it with this that feels so hopeful. And yet, I don't know. I don't know what they're going to say. I don't know what's going to come up. But always something interesting comes up. And I'm always surprised. And that's one thing I love about teaching, that I learn from my students, and they surprise me. I do it all the time. I just need to give them opportunities to uh, express themselves. And then those wonderful moments come. This also can give me an opportunity to be a little bit vulnerable and tell my story about, um, and this is, this is December, this is Christmas Eve in 1968, and then just uh, six months later, um, you know, we're walking on the moon, and I remember that so well. I don't know if anybody else in here is old enough to remember that. But I can talk about how when I was a little girl, and that feeling of looking up at the moon that night and knowing that we're going to go in and watch on our television sets as somebody walks on that moon, that feeling of awe. Um, so whenever you can share those kind of personal events, I think that leads to vulnerability and impact as well. Okay. Mary, I think I'm going to skip a couple of these just in the interest of time because time is running short. I'm going to skip that one too. Um, I think this is a great question. Um, how might this knowledge help you be a better person, a better partner, a better parent, a better sibling? Um, Think about as you're teaching a new principle, how can what you're learning help you be a better person? That's the kind of a question that has all sorts of possibilities with it. Give your students a time to free write about it, and then they can really apply that principle in their, uh, to themselves and, and to think about how uh, how they can become a better person. OK, one more, Mary. Um, what are we trying to do? How well are we doing it? I love these questions. They come out of the tech industry. Um, 
as they're trying to think of ways uh, to make technology better, to improve technology. What are we trying to do? How well are we doing it? I think these are questions, and this is something I haven't used yet, but I want to. We can ask these questions at the end of our class. What are we trying to do? And I love the we in there because it's communal. Communal. It's about building that community. I am not alone as a teacher in the classroom, and students are not alone either. They're not we're not, we don't have to be separate. We can be, come together and create knowledge together. So what are we trying to do today? How well are we doing it? How can we make it better? And what kind of risks do we need to take to find a better way forward? I like these ideas at the end of, at the end of each class maybe, and then maybe as a midterm kind of summary. I think those are great questions to think about. And I think when you ask those kind of questions as a teacher of your students, you're take, you are taking a risk because you don't know what you're going to get. But every time I've taken a risk, it pays off. Okay, Marianne. Most students receive feedback through writing, uh, whether it's scores or some written feedback. <coughs> so I thought, what would happen if I offered more verbal feedback, if during the semester I inserted individual conferencing at the beginning, the middle, and the end so that I could work one-on-one -on -one with students talking through their writing, telling them, this is what I see happening here. This is your organization overall. Maybe you could try X, Y, or Z so that my freshman students are able to revise and improve taking verbal and written feedback to determine how to become a better writer. Uh, so it was an experiment this last semester to try this three different times. And I asked for some anonymous feedback. This is very casual. This is, this is not scientific feedback. But it was just to help me see what they thought of the experience of, of working with me on their writing. Um, so I asked a couple of questions. and. I said required conferencing was a strong emphasis in this class. Which response best describes your feeling about conferencing? Yes, I gave them points so that they would actually show up. But overall, they found that conferencing really helped them to hear, this is what I see happening. This is how we're putting your paper together. These are my freshman 1010 students who, if they get the foundation of writing now, it helps them in all of the rest of their classes. So I found this useful. Um, I asked them about the idea of verbal versus written feedback. And overall, they found that they prefer a combination of that. They like the written feedback, but they also like hearing from the professor, this is what's working, this is what's not working. And so I went on and I asked this. If I had required conferencing voluntarily with no points involved, do you think you would have visited me on your own? So some honesty here, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I like about this class, uh, these, these sections, is, is they were honest about their feedback. But I, I like that somewhat likely is there. But I had to push it. I had to make it a requirement so that, that maybe they could see the value of it as well. Um, this is what I like the best, though. How likely are you to voluntarily reach out to a professor for in-person individual assistance when you need help coming to your office hours? This is what I like seeing, is that maybe by feeling comfortable in a conferencing situation with me, where I've kind of gone out of my comfort zone, maybe they're going to be more comfortable approaching all of you and saying, hey, can I talk to you about this concept that I don't understand? So modeling that, I did have some anonymous feedback here that overall students said, I learned more about my writing instead of just a generalized lecture. I looked forward to it. You know, I was scared because I thought you were just going to bash on it the whole time. But I, I looked forward to it. I wanted to improve. I wanted to give 100%. I figured out why writing is important, how to use it in my future. I started to become more comfortable with sharing and getting feedback, opening themselves up to constructive criticism so that that vulnerability is there, but they want to improve. Um, 
the combination of the verbal feedback and the written feedback was something that they liked a lot. Um, they were able to better chart more specifically the areas of writing where they've progressed and what they can continue to work on. And they started to feel more valued as communicators. They were more excited to attend class because it wasn't just some notes on, on their writing. And they, they cared about their own writing and their writing goals. Um, as we pull this together, Susan and Bonnie and I found some similar results that when we put ourselves out trying something that feels uncomfortable to us, we establish a greater sense of trust with our students. They know that because we're doing it, they can try too. They can maybe experiment and try and maybe sometimes fail because some of my experiments in class don't work very well. And I acknowledge that. Um, our approachability goes up. They see us as human. They maybe come to our office hours a little bit more to get that um, uh, feedback. And because we demonstrate an act of courage, they see that that's something that they want to try as well. And maybe they're going to push themselves a little bit more. So with the last five minutes, I was hoping to open this up and get some ideas as to what you've tried in your own classrooms it's initially felt a little uncomfortable, but maybe it worked out really well, or maybe it didn't work out, but you keep trying because of that modeling. Please. So I teach uh, deaf signers in the educational field. I have mostly sophomores and juniors, and last semester we did one week a year of totally I would say so, and they probably remember that at the end of the semester. I think that's a fantastic idea. Thank you. Let's get a couple more. What have you tried that made you feel a little uncomfortable? Please. I teach English too. And um, what I do before a research paper is something that is totally not risky for them, which I think is possible because they know it's really hard for me, is I ask them to write any questions they have about the paper, big, small, probably not big enough, right? Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Just do what you're saying. But try to answer any question and I will answer. I go I collect each index card, they explain everything anonymously, and I go through each one and I answer it in class. And I tell them several times over that this is really hard because I have no idea what they're doing. So let them know there's a challenge in doing this. Um, and um, and I, I that's a little scary at first because I don't know what's coming. But I've done it enough that I kind of know that they usually have some of the questions that come up and a few will be get to be questions that I don't know who they are. But I know who they are. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but that's always kind of a challenge, too, that I've ended up really getting a lot of good feedback from the students about, too. That it eases them, because they get to ask them a little more. If I just did that with the class, I'm going to get the same response from the students that I'll ask the same question. Mm -hmm. And this way, I get everybody to at least give me some questions. So that's something that I got a little nervous about at first. That's not to ask them, because I kind of can prepare for what they're probably going to ask. But every now and then, mm -hmm. they ask a crazy question about how do I tell you something that I don't have a clue to or something that's kind of wonky like that. But um, you can talk it through in, in your virtual world. 
I love that because we, we do get comfortable in our lesson plans and we have things thought through every possibility with our lesson plans, but to allow them to ask anything. Oh, about the about, well, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Let's clarify. <laughs> I think three is a perfect number. Let's get another one. Fantastic. They've, like Pokemon, they're evolving at the end of the semester. I love that. So, and, and there's ulterior motives. I'm stealing all of your ideas to use in my classroom as well. But uh, I think, let's see, we have one more minute. Anybody else dying to share? Please. And we need this because. We don't want to feel like idealistically all of this always works because it doesn't always work. Yeah, so I wanted to get my students reading more. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be really cool if they got to choose their own articles. And then I put them into groups. Every, every week I'd have them in a group talking about the one article from the person each week. So you'd have groups of seven and then. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes try after try after try to figure out what actually does work. Mm -hmm. And we learn a lot from what doesn't work. <laughs> I've learned a lot. <laughs> so thank you. If, if anything, try something risky this semester, something that makes you feel uncomfortable. And maybe share it up front with your students that this is something new so that they see you as someone who is also a lifelong learner. So thank you.